for the license. Let's, let's just take that thing out of circulation altogether. Um, but I remember going out to my parents and saying, I don't want you guys to die. And my parents just embracing me and hugging me and saying, no, we're not, we're not going anywhere. We're here, we're here. I remember the, when Michael Jackson did the moonwalk on the Grammys, and my mom was up and just dancing. She was loving it. My parents would go to concerts all the time. She's to blame for my love for Barry Manilow. I mean, it, this is confession. It's good for the soul, right? Like, I like Barry Manilow. Uh, she's ruined me, yes, in, in maybe a good way. I don't know. But, you know, there, there was that tenderness of my mom where, yeah, she, she was the disciplinarian. You know, in, in some houses, it's like, wait till your dad gets home. In my house, it was wait till your mom gets home. Um, but she was tough, but she was tender. In 32 years, she's been gone. And I posted a, a picture on Facebook last night. So if, if we're, we're besties on Facebook, because that's where besties hang out on Facebook, uh, you can see a picture of my, my family and me rocking some sort of weird early 80s hair, mullet, something. I don't even know what that is. But, but I was thinking about that term tough and tender. You know, Susan Morgan, man, happy Mother's Day. L- love her, miss her. But tough and tender is also something that we need to discuss when it comes to God. See, God is both tough and tender. And and there's a reason why we must understand both of those terms when it comes to God is because if if you have a God who's all tough and no tender or a God who's all tender and no tough, uh, it's kind of like parenting. This is not a parenting talk, but I'm going to give you really some golden nuggets right now. If, if all your parenting is about discipline and there's no love, your kids are going to rebel against you. If your parenting is all about love and there's no discipline, your kids are going to resent you. Rebellion comes out of a relationship with parents that it's just all about driving home rules. It's all about performance. It's all about discipline and there's no tenderness involved, your kids will rebel against you. But if you're all soft towards your kids, you want to be their best friend versus their parent, and there's no discipline, your kids are going to resent you later on. See, this is not what God wants in his relationship with us. He is the, the almighty, amazing, heavenly father who has gifted us with life, and now he says, I want you to be my sons and my daughters, and we want a God who's tough and tender. We need to have a God who is stern when it comes to discipline because he knows what's best for our lives. And when we don't do what's best, he he needs to do something because he wants what's best for his glory and our good. But if he's not tender, then we have this, this, this father who's more like a divine judge and policeman that we're constantly just living our lives cowering because we wonder when he's just going to punish us again. And God's not... Either one of he's both tough and tender. And Zephaniah, this prophet, talks about both aspects of God. And so in, in honor of Mother's Day, we get, get to talk about the tough and tenderness of God. The toughness and tenderness of, of this, this God we call Heavenly Father. And Zephaniah, let me just tell you, it's, it's a very odd thing prophecy to talk about on mother's day because it's talking about the day of the lord the day of judgment that's coming and and the goal with my message this morning is this i want you to leave here prepared for what is inevitably going to come you're you're not going to be here forever do you guys know this the mortality rate is 100 percent. we're all going to die the question i know but How are you preparing for what is inevitable? And you don't know when you're going to die. Your birth certificate, my birth certificate doesn't have an expiration date on it. We wish we knew, right? My mom did not expect to die at age 39. Lori's mom did not expect to die at age 65. I could die tomorrow. You could die today. Happy Mother's Day. I mean, this is great. So, so it's my responsibility to love you and not gloss over hard subjects, but to prepare you for your eternal destiny. 
And my prayer is that your eternal destiny is one set with a God who is joyful and delights in his kids and in a place where you will delight in him forever and ever and ever. The key is, are you prepared to go to that place? Because the the entrance to that place is through the personal work of Jesus Christ that we're going to talk about this morning. So turn your Bibles to Zephaniah. We're going to meet the, the, the toughness of God. We're going to see the tenderness of God. There's a lot more toughness than tenderness in Zephaniah, but at least there's tenderness, right? Sometimes um, you can watch a movie, you can listen to a song, and it, and it just seems to get worse and worse and worse and worse. But boy, if there's that little uptick at the end, like, okay, it made it worth it, then great. So the toughness and tenderness of God. Zephaniah, you guys all there? Okay. Let me give you a historical context because it's important. Israel had a king by the name of Hezekiah. Uh, You can read about the background of this historical uh, context here in 2 Kings 22-23. Hezekiah was a king who honored the Lord. Zephaniah is Hezekiah's great-great-grandson. Why is this important? Because Hezekiah honored the Lord... He left a lineage with his son, great-great-grandson, Zephaniah, desiring to honor the Lord. It's almost like me saying, hey, I'm the great-great-grandson of Thomas Jefferson, and I want to speak about the American culture and government. And you would listen to me because of my heritage, right? Like, wow, this guy knows something. He's, He's connected through heritage by somebody who really set up this amazing form of government. But after Hezekiah came and went the nation of Israel just started going downhill. Spiritually, just became bankrupt. Manasseh took over. They started worshiping other gods. Uh, They started following false idols. And so there was these decades of just waywardness until this young king came along by the name of Josiah. Josiah took the throne at eight years of age. Eight years old, occupying the throne it's like a it's like an old testament princess diaries uh, episode right so but he takes the throne at eight years old and at this point no one has any idea about the lord god of israel or any message that this lord god has left because it's been buried away in the corner of the temple collecting dust And someone goes into the temple and finds the word of the Lord and brings it to Josiah. And Josiah goes, this is what we need. See, we have been we have been empty of God's wisdom and counsel. We have been negligent in understanding what he wants for us. And now the word of God has been uncovered. And so Josiah reads the word to the people and their hearts begin to break because they realize what they've done for so long. They've neglected God. So all of a sudden, there's this reformation that takes place under Josiah's rule. And it's under this reformation that Zephaniah comes along and partners with King Josiah in calling the nation back to God. And the prophecy of Zephaniah, three chapters, deals with three things that we're going to touch on this morning. God's concern about behavior, God's command about belief, and then lastly, God's commitment about blessing. Three things. The first is going to be aimed at the people of God. The second is going to be aimed at those who do not know God. And the last is aimed at those who know and love God and what's promised to them regarding the blessing that God has for those who love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Zephaniah's name means hidden of the Lord. And this is key because as Zephaniah talks about the day of the Lord, this coming day of judgment, the key is to be hidden in the Lord. He forms security around those who love him. He forms protection around those who love him. The question is, how will you be protected when that great day of the Lord comes? Will you be found hidden in Christ 
or will you be found on your own? And I'm going to tell you, left on your own, you don't stand a chance. When he comes and righteously judges the earth. And so, the first point is critical. And that is God's concern about behavior. Because here's what I'm going to say, and this is for those of you, and, I, I, and you guys know my, my, my style, I, I'm just direct. Okay? So I apologize in advance if I offend you. My ultimate aim and my ultimate goal is to have us who claim the name of Jesus live lives that honor the name of Jesus. Amen? Covenant relationship brings with it covenant responsibilities. The fact that God chooses to, to love us and, and set his affections upon us and accept us in Christ, when you enter a relationship with God through Jesus, it ought to change your lives. You ought to go, wow, I was deserving of death, but now I've been given life. I was deserving of hell, but now I've been given heaven. I was deserving of condemnation, but now I've been set free because God has chosen to love me. I mean, that's the gospel, right? Jesus came to give us life and to give it to us abundantly. And now understanding that love and that gospel, it ought to set my life on a different trajectory. It ought to affect the way I live. But unfortunately, we live in a culture with those who claim the name of Jesus, but their lives don't demonstrate any love or affection for Christ whatsoever. Have you seen this? And and, and, and honestly, I've come to accept, I don't like it, but I've come to accept that even among those who claim to be Christians, I realize that they're not. You could call yourself a Christian. I'm going to take it at face value. But I'm also going to be like, I'm going to watch you. Because not everyone who professes possesses. I want to be serious in my love for Jesus. And I realize I may be in the minority. You have to understand that the Bible is clear about this, that you may be in the minority. You may be surrounded with people who are like, Jesus, yeah. On Sunday for an hour and a half. We could do the Jesus, yeah, yeah, for an hour and a half on Sunday and then live Monday through Saturday living life like hell. Not honoring God whatsoever. Bringing total disgrace upon the name of Jesus. Come right back on Sunday and be like, yeah, yeah, Jesus. And I, I, don't want, I don't want that. I want you to passionately love Jesus in your lives. I want your lifestyles to reflect the glory and honor of God. I want the things you do, the people you hang out with, the things you post on social media to point to the richness of his grace and mercy in Christ Jesus. Because there's people out there looking for authenticity and some of you are not giving them that. Which makes me go, do you even know Christ? Because covenant relationship brings responsibilities. If you went to work tomorrow and you had a clear job description that you were supposed to live up to, and you didn't, (laughs) what's going to happen? Your boss is going to call you and be like, "Uh, we hired you on to do these things, and you're doing nothing of these things. Either change, or you're out. See, God's got a job description. And he's saying, here's the description, and you want to know what the description is? It's really easy. It's one word. Jesus. Write that down. It's Jesus. And and why is it Jesus? Because when you come to know God and understand the riches of his grace and his mercy, you become more and more conformed to the image of Jesus. God's goal in saving you is not just to give you a ticket to heaven. God's goal in saving you is not just so you can have a reunion with a departed loved one, i.e. my mom. God's goal in saving you is not just to get you you fire insurance so you don't have to go to hell. That's not the gospel. The gospel is understanding what God has done for you in Jesus. 
your heart melts because he's done for you what you can never do for yourself. And every day your M.O. is to say, I'm going to live for his glory. Because he is a great deliverer. He is an amazing rescuer. He is a, a, a blow your mind kind of redeemer. And I'm going to live my life in, in response with gratitude and thankfulness and say, I'm going to honor him. Because here's the, here's the danger. You receive what God's give you and you live your life with no reflection of, of thankfulness. You are deceiving yourselves. You have a false sense of security. That's why Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the way that leads to to life. Because Jesus understood people follow him for all the wrong reasons. So, (laughs) that's pretty black and white, isn't it? But I don't want you to leave here with this false assurance. You need to look at your heart. And there's three things you need to examine. Loyalty, passion, and pursuits. And Zephaniah brings these things up. Because in case you haven't heard, Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you can't serve two masters. You're either going to love one or hate the other, but you can't serve both. Some of you have one foot in with Jesus, the other foot in with career. One foot in with Jesus, one foot in with sex. One foot in with Jesus, one foot in with hobbies. One foot in with Jesus, one foot in with fill in the blank. And no, there is no such thing as divided allegiance when it comes to pursuing Christ. You're either all in or you're all out. And your life will reflect that. Look at your checkbook. Look at your daily calendar. What is your life consumed with? Because if you're giving God your chump change of an hour and a half on Sundays and think you're in, I'm going to tell you, you're not. Zephaniah. Look at these verses here. Chapter 1, and he starts right out the gate. Verse 2, I'm going to completely remove all things from the face of the earth. That's a good way to to start a letter, isn't it? Now notice what's happening here. Zephaniah actually refers back to creation, and he reverses it. All the things that God put on the earth, he's saying, I'm going to uproot. I'm going to remove man and beast, remove birds of the sky, fish of the sea, And the ruins along with the wicked, I'll cut off man from the face of the earth. I will stretch out my hand against Judah, the people of God, who should have known. And against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off from the remnant of Baal and from this place the names of the idolatrous priests along with the the priests. So there's even the religious leaders were falsely worshiping other gods. I mean, think about it. What if you came here and not only did we have Jesus on the stage... We put Buddha here. We've got Socrates here. We've got the Vedas of Hinduism. We've got Joseph Smith with Mormonism. We've, and it's just this whole smorgasbord of religious, religiosity. And we're just like, <laughs> it's all good. All roads are going to get you to where you need to go. And God's saying, I'm going to come and I'm going to take that coffee house where you think you can worship all these gods and I'm going to turn it on its head. I'm going to ruin your espresso machine and your your comfy seats. I'm going to ruin, I'm going to turn you over. And God says, you can't, no, there's no divided allegiance. There's one God, sovereign over all. He is deserving of our undivided worship. It is not a potpourri of gods. It is not a smorgasbord of deities. He says, and those who bow, verse 5, down on the housetops to worship God and at the same time, bow down and swear to the Lord and swear by a false god by the name of Milcom. There's a new god for your list. But here's the thing. These people had divided hearts. And I'm going to tell you right now that the thing you spend your, your, your mind occupied with, the thing you allow your heart to be attached to, that's your god. The thing that you think about continually, the first thing you think about when you wake up, the last thing that's on your mind when you go to bed, the thing that propels you through the day, that's your God. See, my prayer for you and myself is this, that you would become so God-saturated, so Jesus-obsessed, where he's, he's, he's all you think about. 
And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, right? All eternity is going to be constantly shouting the the declaration that he is Lord. Some are going to do it voluntarily. Some are going to do it involuntarily. The question is, what camp are you going to be in? Because you need to get started doing it right now. And understand that there is unspeakable joy for those who have undivided allegiance to Christ and Christ alone. Men and women who today desire to honor Jesus above all other things. You can tell their their language drips with praise to Jesus. Their activities constantly point to the love and compassion of Jesus. Their behaviors emulate Jesus. When you're with them, you're thinking, am I with Jesus? And that's God's goal for every single one of us. Is that as we go out into the world and rub elbows with people who don't know Jesus, that when they leave our presence, they have an idea of what it means to spend time with Jesus because they've been with us. That doesn't mean you're perfect. Amen? That doesn't mean you have this all together. But doggone it means you're striving for that. You're striving for that. There's this movie called The Mission. Robert De Niro, Jeremy Irons. Top three movies of all time in my life. Who's seen it? Only came out 30, 31 years ago. Something like that. Some of you weren't even born yet. It's cool. I feel really old right now. The mission is the story of a man, played by Robert De Niro, who had lived his life for so long going into the jungles of uh, Uruguay, South America, taking natives, capturing them, selling them into slavery. And this man, and I won't tell you what happens as far as the turn of events in his life, but he ends up committing a crime, and his punishment is to travel with these priests back to the very villages where he was taking people captive from and serving them. And there's a scene in the movie where De Niro has all of it. Now, this takes place like in the 1600s, so he he would wear full armor. There's a scene in the movie where he's got this big bag of all of his armor hauling this thing. It must be 150, 200 pounds, just hauling. Well, they got to climb up these waterfalls to the villages at the top of the waterfalls, and he's trying to haul this thing up as he's climbing this cliff. And he continues to struggle and fall back and can't make it up. And eventually he does get to the top when all of a sudden one of the priests comes and takes a knife and cuts the rope. And all his, all his armor falls way hundreds of feet down into the ravine. And he starts crying. And he's sobbing because he has just been set free from the very thing that defined his life in the past. But he understands now that he doesn't need what defined his life in the past. He needs to be free of that. And from that moment on, he begins to serve these people and comes to know the Lord and is changed. Why? Because the past is no longer defining who he is. His identity is no longer tied to those, that armor. That was who he was, but now he's a new person. And I sit there and go, ladies and gentlemen, this is what the grace of God offers you through Jesus Christ. Freedom from your past. That you are no longer uh, under bondage to shame or guilt. All those things you were back then in your BC days, i.e. before Christ, right? Bad mullets and, and, and everything. That God loves you and accepts you and says... You are a different person now. Quit hauling around all the stuff that defined you years ago. Quit dragging behind you things that that told you what your identity is and now know who you are in Christ. Your identity is one who is loved by God unconditionally in Jesus Christ. Let that truth set you free. Let that now define your life and quit worshiping other gods. You don't have to do that. God has changed your heart, and if he has changed your heart, pray for that yearning and that longing and that hunger and thirst for righteousness so that day by day you can continue to be conformed into the image of Jesus. That's the goal. If you do not detect conformity into the image of Jesus and you maybe have never felt that, you need to reassess what gospel you've believed. Because maybe you believe the gospel of, 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 of Winfrey. Maybe you have believed the gospel of Osteen. Maybe you believe the gospel of Deepak Chopra. Maybe you've been, There's a lot of interesting religious syncretism out there where there's this melding of Jesus plus other things. Let me just tell you, it's not Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus plus nothing. Soli Deo Gloria, God alone. 
It is God alone, and your life should not be this mix of multiple things you worship. It should be Christ alone, and that's what Zephaniah is calling the people back to. Tim Keller said this in his book, Counterfeit Gods. How's that for a title? The human heart takes good things like a successful career, love, material possessions, even family, and turns them into ultimate things. Our hearts deify them as the center of our lives because we think they can give us significance and security, safety and fulfillment if we attain them. But in the end, only God can provide that. Your goal, my goal, is to understand if you claim the name of Jesus, your life should reflect that. My heart is prone to wander. Your heart is prone to wander. Today is the day of salvation. So no undivided loyalty. Number two, passion. What are you passionate about? Look at verse 13. He says, these people have pursued wealth. It has become their plunder. Their houses are desolate. They build houses, but they do not inhabit them. They plant vineyards, but do not drink. These people are so wealthy that they have homes they're not even occupying, and vineyards that are, they're not even you know, reaping the harvest from because they be consumed with money. Verse 18, chapter 1, neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them. See, the thing is this, you ought to be passionate for Christ because Christ is the only thing that will let r- reign for eternity. You're not taking your car with you to heaven, just FYI. You're not taking your home with you to heaven. Naked you came into this world, and how are you going to leave? Naked. Naked. Guys, what is a profit of man if he gains the whole world yet loses his soul? See, this is what we're talking about right now, your soul. Lastly, it's not just your loyalty, your passions, but it's your pursuits. Who are you worshiping? Who are you pursuing? Can I give you a, a choice? This, is, this passage is so choice. Philippians chapter 3. Paul talks about running this race, and he's, he's, he's so focused on Christ that he says he's, he's considering all other things that this world offers as, as garbage for the sake of just knowing Jesus. See, that, that is our pursuit. That is what we should be striving after. And so in verse 3 of chapter 2, Zephaniah says this, Here, here's the solution. Here's the solution. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth, who have carried out his ordinances. Notice, you who claim to know Jesus will carry out what he wants. If you're not carrying out what Jesus wants, you don't know him. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. So notice the three things there. Write these down. Number one, seek the Lord in humility, meaning confess sin. Blessed are those who are broken, who are bankrupt, who realize I can bring nothing to the table, but this is what makes the glory of God so incredibly rich, is that he brings it all to the table for us. So you seek the Lord in humility, you seek the Lord in obedience, meaning your behavior changes. You're a new creation in Christ. Your appetites are different. Your desires look different. You may be in the world, but all of a sudden your life becomes to look different from those who are pursuing the course of this world. You're pursuing the course of Jesus. So there's a confession of sin. The heart has to change. I'm not talking about behavior modification here. I'm talking about a heart change that understands who we are before God, He is holy, we are not, we are sinners deserving of death, but yet He reaches out to us with such grace. Confess sin, we become broken before Him, He then sets us on a trajectory to change our behavior, and then lastly, there's a, uh, the idea of seeking the Lord in righteousness. We are compelled day by day to become more like God. There's another reiteration of this passage in Second chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 some of you may know the passage if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways i will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land this has nothing to do with america okay 
Can I just take the, the whole gospel and American patriotism and separate the two? This has to do with a repentant people who understand their waywardness. And there's three things that God calls them to, the same three things that Zephaniah calls the people to, a deep humility, seeking refuge in God, and per- pursuing a righteous life. Done. This is what God wants for us. So let me close this section. The other two are going to go quick. Don't worry. I'm going to get you to your lunchtime reservation. Actually, you're the first service. We got, we got a little bit more time than the second service to get to your reservation, right? No, I'm just kidding, okay? Let me close with this. In case I haven't been emphatic enough, I love Jesus, and I'm going to pursue Jesus on a daily basis. However imperfect that looks, I'm going to long and yearn for Jesus, and I'm going to let my life demonstrate that. I want my wife to, to, to see that. I want my children to experience that. I want everybody I come in contact with to not have a, a doubt over the God I love and serve. And I want that for you. Because if you continue to claim Jesus and yet demonstrate a lifestyle that looks opposite of Jesus, you ought to be gravely concerned. Trust in the true gospel today and let that gospel transform your life. Amen? Because here's the promise. There's a remnant. The Bible speaks of a remnant that just because you go to church doesn't mean you're a Christian. Amen? Just because, Pastor, I got the Ten Commandments right there in my car. I read those every day. That doesn't mean you're a Christian. You know, I, I pray every night. Yeah, well, that doesn't make you a Christian. We can go through a lot of religious ritual and have a heart that is devoid of Christ. We're not talking about behavior. We're talking about a heart that worships Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen? And if you want to join that parade, I'm all for it. But if not, I'm, I'm going to continue to point back to Jesus. Because, you know, the toughest time I have in this world as a pastor is not with those who don't know jesus it's with those who claim to know jesus whose lives don't demonstrate love for jesus and i kind of want to spiritually like i wish there was a license that i could get away with like choke holding people <laughs> like like is this a spiritual gift like can i grab you by the collar shake you a little bit i mean i love you guys and i want what's best for you but more than what's best for you i want the gospel of jesus to be honored And I want you to help honor that. Don't bring discredit upon the name of Jesus. My job's hard enough. Your lives are hard enough. Let's glorify God and honor Jesus in everything. Amen? In everything. Second point, we're going to breeze through this one quickly. Some of you are like, yeah, happy Mother's Day. Here's an hour-long message, Pastor Scott. Thanks a lot. God is concerned about belief. There's a, there's a concern, there is a, uh, I forgot the word I used, there's a, um, what's it say in the blank there? You guys got me all out of track. Oh, command. You have to believe. The problem is, there are people who don't believe, they're not going to get off scot-free. In chapter 2, he talks about all the nations uh, that were east and west and south and north of Israel. No one... You have to, the key to knowing God is believing in Jesus. It's, it's simple, but yet it's profound. It's, it's simple, but it's complex. It's about belief in Christ. But the problem with unbelief is this. Write this word down in, in, your, in your notes. Pride. Look at chapter 2, verse 10. He brings this indictment to the nation saying the day of the Lord is coming. So believers live honorably because you don't know when he's coming back. Number two, those of you who don't know Jesus, let your pride be broken and come to him in humility. But the problem is when it comes to unbelief is pride. I got this, God. I don't need you. Verse 10, this they will have in return for their pride because they have taunted and become arrogant against the people of the Lord of hosts. They treat the people of God with contempt. They treat ultimately God with contempt. Why? Because they are self-sufficient. They are self-righteous. They can take care of themselves. They don't need God. And let me just tell you, you, we all desperately need God. 
because you don't have what it takes. Because God requires perfection, and all of you have already failed at that today. Amen? Good job. It's like two weeks ago, did you know they were trying to break the two-hour marathon? Nike sponsored a, a race where they thought, we can do this. And they bring the finest runners in the world out to break a two-hour marathon. It's never been done before. So last week they did it. The fastest man from Ethiopia. Those guys are fast, right? Guess what he finished in? And he gave it all he had. Two hours, 25 seconds. Can you imagine? Like he said, I knew I should have took that corner a little bit faster. Like 25 seconds. So it has not yet been beat. I don't know it will be beat, the two-hour two mark. But just imagine how that man felt. Missed it by 26 seconds. And I can't help but think about how this is a picture of, of the gospel message. That none of us measure up to what God expects. We all fall short of the glory of God. And some of you are thinking, well, I'm, I'm this close. No, you're not. I, if I only did these things, I could get in. No. You come empty and bankrupt before him and realize that no matter how many good works, no, many, no matter what you do, you need to realize that it's ultimately pride that needs to be broken down and an utter humility that you come fully dependent upon him because only he can give you what, is, what he accepts in heaven, and that is perfect righteousness. Praise God for a Savior. Praise God for Jesus who gives us his righteousness free. And says, if you believe in me, I will give my righteousness to you on your account. And now you don't have to pay your way to get to heaven because you could never pay that tab. Can you imagine that? So Jesus says, quit trying to run the, the one hour, 59 minute, 59 second marathon. And accept by grace what I've done for you, which you could never do for yourself. See, the gospel has no room for your effort. It's got no room for your works. It's got no room for your contribution because guess what? He has done it all. That's why we celebrate, right? It's, our, it's repentance that leads us to your mercy, your kindness, God. It's repentance, meaning I have to do a 180 and turn from what I thought I was self-sufficient in doing and realize that I'm really deficit in everything that needs to be done, but Christ has done it for me. Amen. So we don't live our lives in doing good works to gain approval. You could never do that. But we do live our lives filled with good works because we've already been approved by God in Christ. That's the difference. You've heard me twice. So those of you who have known me, you hear me say this all the time. But it's so true. You do not do good works to gain approval. You already have that perfect in Christ. Now you live, do good works to reflect how you are approved already in God. Amen? Last point. God's commitment about blessing. And this, oh man. The prophets have such a way. It, and can I just tell you, like if you look at all the prophets, especially the minor prophets, here's how the story goes. Things get really, 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 really bad. And then they go really, 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 really good. This is no different. Like, we're going, happy Mother's Day, we're going to talk about the day of the Lord. Happy Mother's Day, we're going to talk about the judgment of God. Check this out. Chapter 3, the last several verses. Let's start at verse 12. And I want to point out three things and we're done. But I will leave among you a humble and lowly people. And they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies. There's a transformation in their lives. Nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. For they shall feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away his judgments against you and has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst and you will fear disaster no more. In that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. 
Do not let your hands fall limp. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. And I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feasts. They came from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden on them. Behold, I'm going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame. I will gather the outcasts. And I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. And at that time, I'm going to bring you in. Even at the time when I gather you together, indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth, and I will restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. See, the note of blessing is here at the conclusion of Zephaniah's prophecy. And there are three things you need to understand concerning the blessing that God has in store for you. Number one, you are preserved. Number two, we are protected. And number three, we are prized. You're preserved, you're protected, you're prized. Notice number one. That God says, for those that are dependent on me, I will preserve you even in the midst of difficulty. Even there's going to come a day when those who oppress you, those who are against you will be taken out. But in the meantime, you are my remnant. You are my people. I will take care of you even in the midst of such difficult situations. Is that not a great promise or what? For those of us who are saying, I'm going to honor God in my life, no matter what my neighbors do, God says, I'm going to preserve you in that. I'm going to honor God no matter what my coworkers act like, God says, I'm going to preserve you in that. And when I do that, I'm going to sing over you, which brings us to the second point, you're protected. You're so protected by God that nothing could ever be done against you, because if he's for you, who could be against you? Romans chapter 8. And not only that, he says, and I delight in you. I sing over you. Notice the language here. The picture is one of a mom holding her child. See, there's so many debate about, you know, when it comes to how do we address God? Is, it, is he he? Is he she? But here is a feminine aspect of God portraying a mom's love and tenderness for her child. And Zephaniah ends with this idea that there's the mom holding her baby and singing over this child, and that child can do nothing but rest and fall asleep because that child knows, I am so taken care of by my parent. See, guys, we hold kids like football, right? Like, I remember my kids, you know, it was like, my wife's like, why are you holding the baby like that? Like, you know, kind of running. You know, mom takes the kid and says, you don't hold the baby like that. Don't hold it. And then, you know, my wife, of course, with her voice, you know, there are times she would sing for our kids. And I'm like, no wonder. They, they didn't fall asleep to Def Leppard and Iron Maiden. Those are the songs I knew, you know. You know, pour some sugar on me doesn't really help the kids fall asleep, you know. But then my wife enters the picture and all of a sudden she grabs that baby. And just that, that instinct of just saying, not only are you protected and, and comforted, but I'm going to sing. And that kid just is like, oh, this is the picture. Why? Because you're prized. God cherishes you and wants you to know you are so prized by him that he delights in you being his child. No matter where you've come from, no matter what kind of shame or guilt may be following you and trying to sabotage your joy, Zephaniah says, listen to the word of the prophet. He's a God who sings over you. And my prayer is that you would hear that singing. That somehow in your life, you may not hear an audible voice of God singing over you, but the singing that God's truth provides. When you read scripture like this and say, thank you God for loving me. Thank you for, there's no condemnation against me. Thank you for accepting me as I am. You need to accept that. You need to realize that there's a God who exalts over you, rejoices over you, and says, I am glad you're mine. It's like the dad who just this week went to recover his son's lost cell phone. So his son, high schooler, accidentally drops his cell phone in the trash at school. 
well, technology is great because then he's got a little locator app, finds out by following the locator that the son's phone actually made it all the way to the city dump. Spent about a half hour with the locator going through heaps of trash. Found his son's cell phone and went home and delivered it to his child. See, something that meant a lot to his son. He didn't bat an eye and go in and say, I'll, I'll, I'll go do this. I'll go find it for you. Even if it means through digging through tons of, of garbage. And I go, what a picture of the Heavenly Father's love for us. Who would enter our world, messy as it is enter our lives as complicated as they are and we all have stories and we all have track records but one thing i know is this no matter where you've been no matter what you've done no how much garbage is built up in your life there's a god who's saying i'm going to find your heart and i want you to know how much i prize your life and i thank god that he's a god who goes through the muck and the mire amen i praise god that he's a god who knows everything about us through and through and still accepts us in Jesus Christ. And so what I want you to leave with is this. If you're being bombarded by shame and guilt and and thoughts of the past and you can never understand how much God loves you, you need to get over that. And you need to hear right here, right now, today, that there's nothing you've ever done that is beyond the reach of God's love. There's nothing that you've ever participated in that could ever not be reached by God's grace. That you can be loved perfectly today. Let Him sing that song over your life. Be free. Walk in liberty. And quit listening to your heart in the past. Listen to the song. The song that says, I love you. I accept you. I will preserve you, I will protect you, and you are mine. And there's nothing anyone in this world could ever do to take you from me because you are forever in God's care. Yes. Amen? Walk in that truth this week. Walk in this truth forever. People ask me, why you so, why you smile all the time? Why are you happy all the time? Why did you jump in jack for Jesus? Because I understand the kind of person I am. I understand the person I was. And I try daily to fight for that joy that's found in Jesus because my identity is in Him. And when you understand how much He loves you, you cannot help but free, be free of the criticism, be free of the condemnation, and walk in who you are in Christ. This is a daily, daily focus of mine. And that's why I'm smiles. Because He's put a new song in my heart. He sings a song over me every day. Listen to that song. Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. How do we do? Are we? Oh, 1017. You guys okay with two minutes past? Okay. To all you moms, happy Mother's Day. Never, ever question your impact and influence on the people in your life. We pray for you. We're thankful for you. Us guys, we would be dead in the water without you. You are are an incredibly precious and valuable part of God's creation. So thank you. Father, we thank you for the moms, for the ladies, for the women that are here today. Pray that they would be encouraged in Christ where so many times there's, there's no thankfulness, there's no appreciation. Lord, let them hear that song from you that says you are mine and you are precious. For all of us here to, to quit listening to the voices uh, in this world and quit listening to the voices in our hearts, help us to hear your voice, the voice that speaks Nothing but words of grace and words of compassion and words of kindness. Thank you, God, that not only do you speak over us, but you sing over us. What incredible, incredible love you've given to us through Jesus Christ. May we walk in the power of the Spirit. May we walk in the wisdom of Jesus. And Lord, continue to allow us to surrender our lives to be conformed to the image of of Christ. Help us to live for your glory. Help us to understand what it means to have a relationship with you that is not based upon performance, but based upon your grace. You are awesome, God. We love you. Thank you for today. 
We look forward to the next time we can be together. Guide and direct our steps. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. God bless you guys. Happy Mother's Day. Have a fantastic time today. All right, guys? Oh, you know what? I'm going to turn my microphone off.